Greetings to those who watch below. Before we start today's video, I'd like to give a huge shout out and say a massive thank you to those who dwell below. They are Steffi Ray, Wicked Witch, Jess Black Curtain, Lisa Watts and Lefty Kim. If you'd like to join them, make sure to check out the link in the description box below. So recently we finished our grand tour of Great Britain, so I thought what better thing to do than have a tour of the USA. That's right, in this next series we'll be hitting up every single state in the US for some truly terrifying paranormal encounters. Today we start with the Lone Star State itself, Texas. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Haunted House in Texas by Southern Bell 4 In 1995 my dad and stepmom bought a house in a small town, Portland, Texas. They took my older sister, brother, and I over to look at it. The minute we set foot inside, I noticed how dark it was. There were windows everywhere, but it still seemed very dark. My sister and I were to share a bedroom upstairs, while my brother took one downstairs along with my parents. I didn't know how long after we moved in that things started happening. The door to my room would sway back and forth at night. Not a lot, but an inch or two, even when there was no AC on. I always slept with a nightlight on, and there were several instances when I would be lying on my stomach and thought one of the cats was sleeping across my knees, but would see no shadow cast from them on the wall. I would awaken to hear things in my room moving on my desk or dresser, or a sound that I tried to convince myself was one of the cats making noises in their sleep, but it would fade, and when I would finally get the nerve to look, the cats weren't anywhere in my room. I started having horrible vivid nightmares of different family members becoming possessed and trying to kill me. Nightmares became a nightly thing for me. I remember one nightmare, the spirit had possessed our great Dane, who was too old to get up the stairs. But in the nightmare, I woke up paralysed in my bed, and the great Dane was standing next to my bed, and the spirit was speaking to me through her, saying how very easy it was to possess a simple creature, and then eventually he planned to possess me but he wasn't that strong yet. While living here, our other dog bit my face one day while my parents were at work when I was ten. I ended up with seven stitches and three scars across my left cheek. On several other occasions after, this dog would snap at my face for no reason. When my sister started her senior year, her and my father got into a big fight, and he sent her to live with my grandma in the next big town over. So my parents moved me into my brother's room on the first floor, and my brother moved up into the room that my sister and I had shared. He never believed me about the door swaying at night, until he moved up in that room. Then, he witnessed it himself. Once my brother and I were home alone watching TV in the living room, when we heard a loud thudding across his room upstairs. It sounded like a gorilla was running across his room. Another time we kept hearing thuds and bangs coming from upstairs, and he went to call my dad because we were scared, and when he picked up the phone, there were strange voices on the phone talking in a strange language. Another time, I was having a nightmare about the house, and woke to my bed shaking, almost as if someone was under my bed pushing it up with their feet. My brother had a lot of the same experience as I did. I would wake up often, thinking my cats were laying at the edge of my bed, but when I would get the courage to look, they weren't there. One morning, I woke up shortly before my alarm was to go off before school, and heard a man and woman's voice talking in the bathroom. The bathroom was directly across the hall from my room, and my parents weren't awake. I heard them for a minute without being able to tell what they were saying, before I heard the man say, We need a new bathroom. Then a few minutes later my alarm went off, and I jumped up and turned on the light. Our back door was sliding glass, and as with most sliding glass doors, there was a lever that had to be lifted to lock it. Several times my brother and I got locked in the backyard. If I was ever supposed to be home alone, I would take a bunch of books and things to keep me entertained outside, so I was not inside by myself until I was older. We always felt as if the upstairs was where it dwelled. You never felt comfortable up there, and I couldn't walk past the stairs at night without feeling like being watched. We would try and tell my parents, but they never believed us. They thought we were trying to get attention. Van Horn, Texas, Disembodied Voices and Sounds, by Bat Cat Owl. 
The day after Christmas in 2009, my wife and I took a road trip from California to Texas. After a full day of driving, we stayed overnight at a hotel where my wife had made reservations. The hotel was located in a small town called Van Horn. At the time, the town was deserted, and the hotel was the only business in operation. In passing, my wife mentioned to me that the person she spoke to on the phone claimed to have had unexplained events at the hotel. We arrived at the hotel after midnight. After checking in, we went to our room. The room had one bed and one closet. The bathroom was to the right of the closet, not far from the room's entrance. The bathroom's toilet was to the left, the sink to the right, and the shower was along the back wall. I decided to unwind and read the hockey news magazine while my wife slept. After 20 minutes or so, I turned out the lights and fell asleep. Suddenly, I woke up to the sound of water splashing and swirling. It sounded like it was coming from the tub in our bathroom. It was very loud, as if someone was bathing or perhaps struggling. It didn't sound as if it was coming through the walls or from outside. I rolled over to see that my wife was sound asleep. A sense of urgency prompted me to grab my flashlight. By the time I got to the bathroom, the splashing had stopped. I walked into the bathroom and it was empty. No signs of life or activity. I checked all around the bathroom for water or wetness. The water was not running in the sink or in the tub. The tub itself was dry to the touch. The toilet wasn't running and the sink was dry as a bone. Then I looked out the room's window to see if there was a swimming pool. There wasn't a pool, just the hotel's parking lot. Later, I found out that the hotel doesn't even have a pool. My wife woke up from my rummaging, and I explained to her what happened. She said she didn't hear the splashing, and promptly rolled over and fell asleep. Checking the clock, I saw that it was after 5am, but it was still pitch black outside. Exhausted, I gave up my search and went to bed. While sleeping, I heard whispering in my ear. I woke up, but I kept my eyes closed. I heard a female voice ask, Who did this to us? I opened my eyes and responded, Who did what to you? The cascade of whispers moved over to my wife's side of the bed. Again the voice asked, Who did this to us? Expecting to see someone, I looked over to my wife's side of the bed, but no one was present. I grabbed my flashlight to look for vents to see if the voice could have travelled from another room. Nothing. I couldn't hear voices coming through the walls either. The door was locked, therefore no one could enter. Finally, I realised that something invisible was in the room. I made an effort to communicate with whomever or whatever spoke to me. Once again, I ended up waking my wife. I told her what I experienced. Yet again, she said she did not hear the whispering. At this point, I checked the time and it was 7am. When we were both checking out, I asked the owner if anyone was staying in the rooms either side of our room. She told us that both rooms were vacant, and strangely enough, we were the only people to occupy that floor. I shared with her my experiences. According to the owner, I was the first to specifically report disembodied voices. She then shared stories of unexplained events witnessed by others. On one interesting note, we did learn of a rumour that long ago, a female was murdered at the hotel. Hotel in Arlington, Texas by TX Gonzo This happened over the summer a few years back when my brother invited my cousin and me to join him and his girlfriend for a week-long vacation around Texas. We didn't go to travel channel destination sites, mind you. It was just a trip to Six Flags Over Texas and then off to Austin and San Antonio. Honestly, the overall trip was so much fun, but the first night would be one to change my perspective of hotel rooms forever. We left on a Wednesday morning at around 6am. We planned to head to Dallas and sightsee for a little bit, before making our way to Arlington and checking into our hotel. I'm from South Texas, so the drive is about a good 8 hours or so. Also, Texans measure the distance from city to city by how long it takes to get there, than actually noting the miles between them. Anyway, everything went well day one, and we had a lot of fun in Dallas. We headed to the hotel around 5pm, and once we got there, we checked in and unpacked our bags. Honestly, nothing felt weird about the room, 
and my cousin and I were pretty comfortable. Sometimes people will tell you they can feel a presence, and usually it's when the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. After we unpacked, we hung out in our room for about an hour before heading back down to the lobby to grab dinner. We got back to the hotel a few hours later, absolutely stuffed. Our room was on the third floor, so we made our way up and set a plan on what to do at the amusement park. So, around 11pm, I decided it was time to shower before heading to bed, and did so. My cousin was already passed out, but I stayed up watching Knocked Up on TV. After my shower I jumped in bed, fairly content with the progression of the day, and looking forward to the following morning. Except, something else had other plans in mind. As I lay in bed, my body was closer to the window in the room, and my head on one half of the pillow. My eyes were closed, and I was trying to lose myself in thought so I could fall asleep. A few minutes into that, I felt a tapping on the other half of the pillow. I thought it was my cousin at first, but then I realised my cousin was still snoring. I panicked, but didn't move. I felt and heard the taps on the pillow again, and this time I was in full-on, this can't be happening again mode. I mustered some courage, and pulled the blanket over me so I could begin to process what was going on. As I lay there waiting, I started hearing footsteps walking at the foot of our beds. Then, the ceiling fan turned on and started rotating. I was terrified at this point. I thought I started feeling the bed itself starting to shake, but after calming myself down, I realised it was me. I was trembling in fear. I slowed my breathing down and recomposed myself and continued to listen. My cousin was still snoring. The footsteps continued pacing back and forth, and then I heard the restroom light come on. Then the toilet flushed once. The light turned off. They turned on again a few seconds later. The toilet flushed again. It continued like this for what felt like an eternity. Every part of me wanted to jump out the bed and leave the room, but I didn't. I don't know why I stayed, but I just did, eventually falling asleep. I was woken up in the morning and I was extremely tired. I don't know how long I was up that night, but I know it was for several hours. As soon as I woke up, it was the first thing I wanted to get off my chest. I recounted the story to my cousin, my brother and his girlfriend, and they didn't know what to say. My cousin didn't hear a thing and slept through it all. My brother and his girlfriend had no problems on their end either. To this day, I hate staying in hotel rooms but I do it anyway. The only difference is now I go in, say a prayer, and ask any visitors to vacate for the night. So far so good, but this is definitely one of those things I'll always remember. Late Night Occurrences and the Abandoned School by Warblaze When I lived with my brother in a small town called Lytton Springs, we were real big into four-wheelers. I had a Yamaha Blaster, and Greg, my sister-in-law's brother, had one of those Honda four-wheel drive utility quads. It was really nice. Anyway, we would go out every other night after school, and go riding down all the long empty roads that seemed to go nowhere. There wasn't much out there but land used for cattle and whatnot. Lytton Springs was a small community of houses, a church with a large graveyard adjacent to it, and a small locally owned old country store. The place was called Les Spraulding's General Store. It was built entirely out of wood, and had an old cast iron oven that they used to heat the place. A few years prior, the founder and owner was shot dead behind the counter. Being that it was a small town where everyone knew each other, this was a big deal. Les was a great guy. He used to give us free sodas for coming by to talk to him and helping him out around the store. Les had built the store himself from the ground up, and was a great friend to the majority of the people in the area. The night he was murdered, a drunk had stumbled into the store, and as he went to pay for his alcohol, he pulled out a gun and ordered Les to empty the register. Les gave him the money, and being a generous and friendly man, had told him he could always come to him if he needed someone to lend him some money for whatever reason. The man pulled out a gun upon receiving the cash, and shot Les in the chest, and left him to bleed to death all alone in the store he had built to support his family. Since Les died, everyone assumed that the store would be closed down, which meant all the ranchers and people in the area 
would have to make the long drive to the next town over to get the things they needed. This town pretty much depended on his store for gas, feed, food, etc. Things just weren't the same after he'd been killed, and some strange things started happening in the area. Greg and I would still ride our quads all over at night, riding with our lights off, with nothing but the moon out to light the dark, lonely roads. We came across a lot of strange things, some that are hard to explain. Near our place we found two abandoned graveyards. One was a Mexican graveyard. It had small faded statues of the Virgin Mary, and crumbling graves with strange engravings on them. They didn't seem to be in Spanish like one would assume. When we discovered this place we were excited. I mean, it's not every day you just discover something like this, especially when you know the area real well. It was tucked away on a small dirt path that led off through some brush on the side of the road quite a ways down. There was a rickety old fence made out of mesquite and barbed wire. It had a strange smell to it that I can't really describe. The air felt musty and cold. Usually when it's cold, the air is crisp. We were walking through the graveyard looking around, trying to read the tombstone, and looking at the dates, all of which were dated from the late 1700s to mid-1800s, there was a total of about 20 tombstones. One of which was separated from the rest, with a three-foot high stone barrier surrounding it. All the rocks had been stacked around it, and there was a faded hue of black paint on the top section of the rocks. They appeared to be limestone chunks, probably gathered from the local area back then, completely natural. In no way were they cut or shaped. The tombstone inside of this barrier was an old Spanish cross. The startling part of all of this was a snake twisting in and out of the gaps in the tombstone. I don't know what kind of snake it was, it didn't look indigenous to the area. We mostly have rattlesnakes, copperheads, water moccasins and garter snakes. This one, however, didn't look like any of those. It appeared to be four to five feet long, about five inches in diameter, but it was hard to tell with it twisting around the way it was. I have never seen a snake do anything like this before. It was like it was defending the tombstone, and was completely oblivious to our presence there. The only thing I can think it might have been doing was trying to shed, but its scales weren't flaky or showed no signs of molting. It was a glossy pitch black, had a viper's head, with big puffy cheeks, and its belly was also the same glossy black as its scales. After watching it swirl around this tombstone for a few minutes, we decided to see if we could scare it off. We grabbed a fallen branch and reached out to poke it. It was completely unresponsive. No signs of aggression, or even trying to avoid the branch. It just kept swirling around the tombstone, like that was its sole purpose in life. We gave up messing with the snake, and decided to get going. That was all that happened that day. On another night, when the moon wasn't out and it was almost pitch black outside, we were out having fun following cars with our lights off, and then getting up real close and turning them on suddenly to mess with people. It was fun in a bored redneck sort of way. We had a few people try and chase us after doing this, which made it even more fun. After about 12am, you maybe have a 5% chance of seeing a car go by, so we rode into Lytton Springs to see if we could find any other people driving around. We were riding around Les Sprawling's store, and around the church and graveyard just looking around. It was the first time we had actually taken the time to look around the small town. There was a water tower, and a ton of enormous oak trees that had to have been hundreds of years old. There was also this giant gazebo looking thing in this clearing of land. It was made entirely of wood, had dirt floors, a small stage, some stalls, chairs and things. People in the area called it the tabernacle, it was where my brother got married. We started circling the graveyard, admiring how large some of the tombstones were, and even though we felt a strange feeling of guilt, we decided to see how exciting it would be to creep through the gate and walk around the graveyard at night. The place was huge, but nothing strange happened until we left. We were going down the road behind the church, and we could see the back door to the church, and a small volleyball court behind it. We slowed down to look back at the graveyard, when I noticed the back door to the church starting to open. A woman in a sickly white dress peered through the darkness at us. She just stood there. We were pretty sure we weren't just seeing things. They locked that place up every night, and I doubt anyone would sleep over. We started to talk about who it might be, and when we looked back to get a better look, she was gone, but the door was still open. 
This kind of creeped us out, so we started to drive off to go back home. When we got to the four-way crossing, there she was again, standing in the middle of the road, arms dangling at her side. She seemed to glow just a little bit, and was very sickly looking, with an expression of devastation. She scared the crap out of us, so we went full throttle and sped right past her. I didn't notice any change in temperature or smell, but then again I was going 60 mile an hour, and had the wind blowing against me. We trucked it about 5 miles back to the house, and never saw her again. Dale is an extremely small town, about 10 minute drive from Lytton Springs. It consists of a locally owned gas station, a railroad track, and two roads that intersect right at the post office. That's it. Other than that it's a lot of land primarily used for livestock. Some of it is heavily wooded, and there are lots of deep ravines running through the woods. Oh, I forgot to mention the old school that was converted into a town hall type of building. The history of Dale is pretty simple. It was where black kids were sent to go to school back when everything was segregated. There are a lot of abandoned buildings that are falling down, made entirely of wood and dirt floors. It's quite the depressing place. My sister-in-law's dad had about 80 acres out there that he leased to cattle ranchers, and a small mobile home, with a shed that was used to process meat. Well, when my brother, who I lived with at the time, moved out of Lytton Springs, his father-in-law said he could put a house on his land, and we could live out there. Sweet deal. So I lived on this big chunk of land, with not much to do but ride my four-wheeler, and go exploring in the woods and whatnot. We had two dogs, Chico and Annie. They would follow me everywhere. One day, while I was following the ravines deeper into the woods, I came across a clearing. The trees in the woods were ancient. I'm talking over 100 foot tall, and had a diameter of 10 to 15 feet. They were massive, and they groaned when the wind blew. I loved how big they were, and I always thought of building the ultimate treehouse in one someday. The only thing was they seemed to be rotting from the top down. Branches would fall all the time, and the wood was very porous, not sturdy at all. Anyway, so I come to this clearing which seemed to be very out of place. There was a decent sized building slumped over in the centre, with weeds and vines and tall grass all over. The Texas sun doesn't help plants thrive, so almost all this brush was dead and dry, and itched as I walked through it to check out the building. By the time I got to the building, my socks were covered in dead seeds and grass. You know how it is. The building was made of wood. The roof had collapsed and there were no doors. A small gravel path led back off into the woods, and there was a rusty sheet metal sign in the front that I couldn't read because it was so corroded. I was sceptical to go inside because it was falling apart, and there were banana spiders everywhere. Then I thought to myself, wow, it's not every day you find something like this in the middle of nowhere, so I carefully went inside. I was mostly walking on a powdery dirt floor, and there were piles of wood in places where the roof had caved in. I was enjoying my little adventure, until I heard the distinct sound of laughter. Okay, who could that be? I knew there were no kids out here, as I had to walk a good way to get out to this place. I went back outside, into the hot sun, and looked around. Nothing. No one at all. I shrugged it off and went back in. My dogs wouldn't go in with me. They kept sniffing around the outside and peeing on everything. When you first go in, there's a tall wooden counter near the wall, with an old analogue clock hanging on a rusty nail, covered in dust with a cracked face. I found some old papers that were so brittle, if you touched them, they would crumble into a dusty powder type substance. The papers were all so faded, they must have been written in pencil or something, because I couldn't read much other than a letter here and there. There was an old metal bell, sitting on the counter, and it worked. Well, sort of. I continued through a doorway, into what I assumed was a theatre or something. There was a small elevated platform that looked like a stage. It had a poorly made podium, and a lot of scattered chairs that were knocked over. It smelled really bad in this room, like an old library or something. It wasn't pleasant at all, so I left and went to the room adjacent to the theatre room. This is where it gets strange. I heard the laughter again, and a light banging noise. I didn't know what to think, so I just kept going. When I walked into this area, it appeared to be a classroom. There was an old blackboard on the wall, and a bunch of tiny wooden desks with scratches and stains on them. All of a sudden, 
I heard a light bang again, and my dog started to bark from outside. I could see slivers of sunlight coming in through the gaps of the wood in the wall. Then those gaps blacked out, as if someone was walking by outside. I said, hello, loudly, and asked if anyone was there. No response. I started to get a little creeped out now. When I looked away from the wall, I noticed an eraser sitting on one of the desks. It wasn't there before. I turned around to leave, and I heard the light bang again. I turned to look. The eraser was now on the ground under the chalkboard. Someone had just thrown the same eraser I was looking at on the desk. Okay, that's my cue to leave. I started heading for the way out again, and that's when the banging started again repetitively. I heard the laughter, and as I looked back at the chalkboard, there were three or four erasers floated and being pounded on the chalkboard, like someone I couldn't see was holding them and playing around making chalk dust. At this point I'd seen enough. I ran for the way out, as the laughing and banging got louder. My dogs were still barking with slight yelps at the end, as if they were calling for me to get out of there. When I got to the lobby area, the clock was spinning backwards. I saw the bright sun beaming through the door frame and headed for it. There was a loud scream and crying as I rushed out of the building into the brush. I didn't look back. My dogs ran to me, and we all ran off into the woods, and I followed the ravine back home. I told my sister-in-law where I was and what I saw. She told me that it used to be a segregated school and was abandoned a long time ago. She told me her and her friends would go back there when they were kids and see who could stay in there the longest at night without getting scared. I told her about the laughing and the chalkboard, and she confirmed that she had seen the same thing with the chalkboard and erasers years ago. I decided it would be best not to go back there again. I felt bad that there are kids still trapped in that horrible place. They seemed happy though. Any ideas on why they are stuck in their old school? And what could that figure have been that I saw through the cracks in the wall? Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, make sure to like, share, comment and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, ensuring to hit that notification bell. One thing I'd be interested in is, what state would you like to see me cover next? Pop your answers in the comments, and I'll see what I can do. So, until next time, sleep tight.